All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you guys? Hope you're doing well. So well that you fall silent and attentive. It's good. It's good to be with you guys as usual. Lots of you are still wearing your coats. I think it's just, you're just habituated to the desperate need for warmth. I think it's not going to last long. So what we're doing here, welcome to class. We are going to, um, we're rechristening this class Foundations. And we're going to spend as long as we feel like working through kind of the, the, the foundations of our faith. And that's kind of what we've been doing in one way or another. But we're going we're gonna to try to think kind of holistically. I've got a big, long, long list of things to talk about that'll probably literally take us like two years to get through, um, literally. So, but as you know, kind of what we feel a great deal of freedom in this class to kind of flex and to kind of follow the needs and the interests of the group. And so we'll be doing that. But we're going to begin, I'm going to try to begin at least kind of some of the absolute, like the base of the foundation, the first layer, the cornerstone of our, of our foundation here. So help me out here. Shout out for me some of the names of people that you know, or the person that you know, maybe, who are the most spiritually, uh, what do I want to say, vibrant or vital. Who do you know that is just like super locked in uh, and mature in their faith, spiritually dynamic, able to withstand the difficulties of life, a blessing to others? Who, who, like, who are their names? Yeah, okay, that's, that was, that's all I really wanted. All right, that's all we're going for. Okay, yes, yeah. What a suck-up class, right? Okay, uh, but in reality, who, who are the people? Who are the, who are the most spiritually vibrant, vibrant people you know? Uh, I mean, maybe here at Holy Spirit or maybe elsewhere. So, yeah. Who? Linda Roach. Okay, great. Linda Roach. Who else? Your mom, Carol Long. Your mom. Mother-in-law. Helen Dyerly. Helen Dyerly. Whoop, whoop. Shout out. Tom Rowe, you want to you nominate yourself? Mike Massey. Mike Massey. Isn't Massey a stud? I love that guy. He's so great. Yeah, Mike Massey. Who else? And it's okay if we don't know him, but I want you to think, who, who are those people that are like, yeah, they are strong in their faith? Johnny Erickson Tata. Okay, and we got some books from her. Johnny Erickson Tata. She's an amazing woman who's lived through. She's, you might know her. She's a, a quadriplegic and an author and just a really very godly woman. So she's got a great story. Who else? Rick Warren. Rick Warren, yeah. And this is a guy who, I mean, his, his pastoral ministry and his ministry as an author has been amazing, but he's also known a lot of grief too, right? You know, some of you know his son battled with depression for some time and ended his own life mm, two years ago maybe, something like that. Sure. Who is it? John Baker. John Baker. I don't recognize the name John Baker. Should I? Or is he a... Celebrate Recovery, okay, founder of Celebrate Recovery, okay, John Big. Oh, really, is that right? Started at Rick Warren's church, okay. Other people, spiritually vi vibrant, vital people? Rob Wicker. Rob Wicker? Rodney Wicker. Rodney Wicker, should I know him? Yeah, he's the past chaplain of Ten Mountain Prison. Okay, chaplain of prison, sure. Everybody except me, all right? Okay, what does it look like? Okay, with, the, with this kind of like host of people in your mind, what does that look like? Like when you, why did they come to mind? What are their, what are their character traits? Prayer warrior. prayer warrior. Okay, just strong in prayer, which is often not the easiest thing to be, right? So good. Prayer warriors. What else? Faithfulness. Faithful. Okay, now there's two versions of faithful, right? There's like the I will, there's faithful and there's full of faith, right? So is it that they just do what they said they're going to do or that they just trust God? Which, which side did you mean when you said that? Trust God. They trust God. So they just are really no full yeah, full of faith. There's some dreadful circumstance going on. They just they have this optimism that God's purposes will prevail. Good. What else? Jesse? Uh, that manifests itself uh, as contentment despite external circumstances. Yeah, you know that Paul says that, he makes that, that line, he says, I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, right? Whether well-fed or hungry, having much, you know, being in need. And you think, okay, well, I'm not sure if I've learned that secret, right? To be content regardless. I'm my apple cart can be upset pretty easily. Good, yeah. What else? Yeah, Courtney? Okay, the know their Bible, right? So you'll see this kind of command of the scriptures. It's familiar. So it's dog-eared, well-worn, and they know where to go to find what God has said, right? So absolutely, a knowledge of the scriptures. What else? Yeah, Sean? Okay, they're humble and don't generally seek attention for themselves. Yeah. You know, I, I've mentioned before, and I'm, I'll probably keep mentioning it because it's such an impact on my life, but Andrew Murray's book, Humility, is the most impactful thing I've ever read in my entire life. 
strongly recommend it. And he makes the point that humility is the chief of all the virtues, which I've never heard anybody else make that claim, although we've often, have you ever heard of what, what is the, the chief of all the sins? Pride. Pride. And so flip that around. What might the chief virtue be? It, it kind of like, kind of corresponds there, right? He makes an overwhelming case that humility is, the, is what, where we see the, the beauty of Christ is seen in his humility and what he offers to us is a, re, is a return to that. So yeah, that, that should mark the lives of people that are, that are vibrant. Yeah, absolutely. What else? A couple other things. Open about their failness, their weakness, right? Absolutely, right? And that, that goes hand in hand with what Sean's saying about humility, but there's just a transparency. I, there's, I don't need to be pretentious. I don't need to put on some act as if I've got it all together because the truth is I don't, and I'm, and I'm safe because if I have this confidence that God really loves me despite it, so I don't need to pretend, right? The gospel gives us a, a great ability to be uh, honest about our badness and our brokenness. That's good. Okay, well, yeah, Andrew. Okay, and how do they handle suffering, Andrew? Yeah. What what is it what is it makes them makes that stand out? Yeah. Yeah. So some of you guys know. So Andrew's saying that the way that they the way that they handle grief, the way they talk about it, discuss it. Matt Chandler's a a, a well known Bible t- a teacher, pastor in Texas. Um, are you thinking of his brain cancer? Is that what you're thinking of? What's that? Yeah. So he went through, was it, was it cancer? I know he had a brain tumor. Was it malignant? He went, he went through this grievous thing, but with, with as, as John was saying, with faith, right? With optimism that, God, that there's not going to be the end of the world, that he's going to walk and trust and God's going to prevail through it, right? Which may yet, which doesn't mean that it's not going to end in death, right? But it does mean that we're going to trust him throughout, through it. We have a friend, some of us, you know that Todd Meyer and Lynn Kidd, Doug Kidd, Kelly, we all went to college together. And uh, we had a friend, a guy named John Rich, uh, not, I'm sorry, John Richmond is friends with him too. John Richmond is doing fine. Different John Richmond. Um, uh, I just glitched, gl- glitched my own name. Who am I thinking about? Kevin Kittrell, thank you. Kevin Kittrell, Kittrell is a friend of ours in school, and he just died um, of cancer. I think it was like stomach cancer. Was it Lynn? What was it? Do you remember? But, but um, Lynn was, I didn't actually see it, but his, his son wrote this kind of tribute to his dad about his great faithfulness, right? Just to trust the Lord throughout. Um, so some things end really very painfully, and yet there's an ability to trust Him. Okay, one or two more. What does it look like for spiritually vibrant people? Sammy. For me, it's, a, it's something that I don't see in my life. It's when somebody shows a lot of grace. Yeah. Uh, anger. Fantastic. Yeah, so there is this, t- people whose lives are spiritually rich have a tendency, Sammy is saying, to show grace to others, right? There's just this patience, a long suffering, not a quick temperedness, right? And, and the, the linkage there, I don't think it's too hard to see, right? Because if you've experienced much grace and you're conscious of it, you're transparent with your, with your brokenness and your badness, and you've experienced grace for it, the natural, normal consequence of that is that we would extend that to others, right? Which is embarrassing when you recognize how quick tempered you can be, right? How much grace have you been shown and does it make you conscious of that? Okay. Kelly, and then Kim. They're so thoroughly comfortable in their identity in Christ that you can take ground in that, that they're not swayed by yeah. all of the things that they'll be frustrated and confused and hurt. Yeah, so Kelly says they're so thoroughly comfortable, so solidified that their identity is in Christ that all these things, all the winds that blow by, they just don't have that big of an effect, right? That's one of the things that I love to see. Jesus is kind of the paragon of this himself. He is so locked in to the love of the Father for him. This is his source of strength, his source of joy, that when the crowds get big, he doesn't get like all excited because the crowds are big and they really like me, right? And when the crowds get small, he's not like, please come back, come back, come back. He's just steady as she goes because he didn't really need your approval in the first place, right? He's so, he knows who he is. He knows the source of his life that everything else is just kind of like, that's fine, that's fine too, as opposed to just being super freaked out by, his popularity and his, you know, the size of his Instagram follower club thing, whatever, you know? All right, Kim? They're living for God and not for themselves, so they're getting, make a practice of laying their lives down. They're living for God and not for themselves, right? They make a practice of laying their lives down, right? Because, and again, this all, this, all these ideas, they all cohere together, right? Because if God is for me, then who can be against me, 
right? If I think everybody's out to get me, then I'm going to have to look out for number one. That'll have to define and drive my life. But if I believe that God is looking out for me, well, then I'm freed up to a whole other way of living. It's just totally different, right? And then that blesses others around them. And then, of course, that engenders affection and love and respect. Don't you love being around humble people? Don't you love being around people that aren't constantly reminding you of this, that, or the other thing, and name-dropping, and da-da-da-da-da, right? Because they just, their focus is on other people, right? Okay, one more burning issue. Jennifer, did you, are you? No, no. Okay, one more. What does it look like? What do spiritually vital, vibrant, living people look like? We got the whole list? Compassionate. Compassionate, okay. So lots of these are like other-centered. Some of these things are God-centered, but lots of it is like the way we experience them is that there's just, there's a, there's a kindness. The ethos of their life is not harsh and brittle, but there's a kindness, a long-suffering. I enter into your pain with you, right? Okay, now think about all these people. What we're describing, I think, I'd be shocked if it wasn't, is what you wish you were, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if I, if I like pulled back a curtain and there was a picture of you, right? And we're saying, yeah, this is what you're like, right? The thing is, all of those attributes, they don't just, they're not natural, right? They don't just come, and they're, not, and they're not accidental. But the people that you're thinking of, the people who manifest these traits, have cultivated this. They've cooperated with the Spirit of God in a significant way, right? God is always the initiator. He is always the producer. We don't just grind this stuff out. It's not like, this is not a big be good club that we're trying to, that we're trying to produce here. But the Spirit of God is alive, he lives in believers, and he is doing things. And you have the ability to yield to him, to cooperate with him, or to resist him. Both of these are, are, are available to you. And so these, this kind of a life, a life of spiritual vibrancy and vitality, you get it because you're cooperating with the Spirit, because you are ingesting, if you will, large amounts of, what Courtney said, his word, right? We know his word, we're yielding to him. I always think my my. my uh, paradigm for this is always Michael Phelps, right? Do you remember when Michael Phelps was in the Olympics? How many times did he do that? Like four, five? I don't know what it was. But do you remember the big kind of shocking fact when he was in the midst of his training? Do you know what I'm thinking of? It was his diet. Do you remember this? The dude eats. Do you remember this, Debbie? How much does this guy eat? 11,000 calories a day. Yeah, the claim was 11,000 calories a day. Now, I did hear an interview with him subsequent to that. Where he's like, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Sometimes it was more like 8,000. Like, all right, fine, okay, right? But the dude is just, just massive intake of calories because he's swimming, I don't know, how many miles a day does a guy like Michael Phelps have to swim? Like, you ever swim a mile? It's like horrible. It's just the worst thing, right? He's probably swimming. Is he swimming 5 miles or 10 miles or 15? I don't even know. But if you're going to keep that up, you have to have input, right? If you're going to be this physical beast, like Michael Phelps, you have got to eat just an enormous amount of high-density food, okay? Michael Phelps could never swim like he could swim on a 2,000-calorie diet, much less on a 1,200-calorie diet, right? There's just no way. If you were to give it a number, I want you to think about this. What is your, if, if a 2,000-calorie diet is a normal, just average diet, right, what is yours? spiritually okay if you get what's a quiet time worth 500 calories you know <laughs> to say if you sit down and you spend I'm, I'm, I'm serious like if you spend like you know 20 minutes in the bible and that is that 500 calories if you're going to spend 15 minutes in prayer is that another what is that worth three or four hundred calories if you're going to come to church if you're going to commune with his people if you're going to listen to worship music if you're going to be memorizing scripture that you can rehearse it if you're going to be um looking for opportunities to serve others, like actively serving. If you're going to like take money out of your pocket and put it in Rwanda's pocket, right? If, if all of these things are calorie inputs, if all of these things are strengthening activities, what's your diet? Are you, are you, are you getting by on like 1,200 calories? Or are you a healthy 2,000 calories? Or... The people that you named that are the most spiritually vital, are they, the, are they living at 8,000 calories? Are they just in the word, right? And the, when they're in the car, they're listening to great teaching. When they're at work, they're engaging with, they're practicing the art of kindness, right? They're moving towards people that are looking for these things. Are we doing that? What, what are we doing? And what we want to do in foundations is, I hope, over the course of these months, is develop within ourselves a zeal, an earnestness, a, an eagerness to, to like 
increase our calories, right? So I'm going to eat more good stuff. I'm going to sit under the teaching of Scripture. I'm going to fill my heart with praise. I'm going to listen to praise music. I'm going to avoid things that are like, you know, the garbage. Ca- I'm guessing Phelps isn't eating a lot of like Doritos, right? Right? So there's calories. Not all calories are good calories, right? Courtney, you may, I, should, I should have consulted with you on your nutrition expert here. But, but what, what are we doing? What are the things that, we're, that are really going to produce in you that kind of a person? That you'll be others, when we do this class in a year, this topic, that they're going to say your name. And they're going to describe these attributes as being part of your life, right? So that's what we want to do. Um, listen to this. This is Matthew 7, 24. Jesus said this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Foundations. You cannot build your life on his words, you guys, if you do not know them. I would say one of the absolute, like, fundamental things is that you have got to be developing the habit to know his word. I have a good friend. His name is Roger Hershey. And Hershey is a legend in crew kingdom. He, uh, he was a campus director at Miami of Ohio and has, has a huge ministry. He speaks all the time. He just has that, an enormously massive, powerful effect on thousands and thousands of college kids' lives. You, you know Hershey Court? Courtney, for sure to JMU, nowhere near Miami, Ohio, but everybody in this kind of space knows Hershey because he speaks and stuff. And Roger was on my team when I was at Penn State. He had directed Miami, then he left that, and he joined my team when I was directing Penn State, and he worked with our Greek ministry. And, uh, oh gosh, Kelly, I don't know. He'd been with us for five years, maybe, and his son was fighting in Afghanistan. He was in the National Guard, got called up, which was a surprise. Didn't know that the National Guard, which you thought was going to pay for college, would send your kid to Afghanistan, but did. And then his, his car drove over a, an, a, a bomb, whatever the, what, like the IED, whatever that is, an IED, and blew up his truck and killed him. And I was at Chuck E. Cheese with Kelly, with some, some friends of ours, and I get a phone call from Hirsch, and it was just a, it was this really weird call where he calls and he's like, uh, and, I, and he can, you can hear all the background noise, he's like, he's like, uh, he said, I'm like, hey, Hirsch. He's like, what's up? He's like, oh, well, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we're at Chuck E. Cheese. He's like, oh. And then he, I can hear him talking to his wife. They're at Chuck E. Cheese. And I'm like, well, Hirsch, what is it? Like, what are, you, what are you calling about? He's like, well, Brett was, Brett was killed. But he didn't want to interrupt us because we were at Chuck E. Cheese after all. So I'm like, yeah, that's okay. And so we went home and went to his place. And we just spent some time with him and then walked with him for months through the grief. And you guys, it was a deep, deep cut, right? And it, there were moments where, like, this could have taken Roger, like, out of the game. It was, it was a deep hurt. But he survived. That was a storm. That was the winds coming and the rains coming. And Hirsch survived the storm because his roots were so deep, right? This is a man who knows the Bible, who has given his life to the proclamation of it, to the development of young men and women. Um, and he survived it barely, Okay. We need to dig down roots. If, you, if, if your little 1,200 calorie gig is working for you, there's no guarantee that it's going to work for long, right? We want to be a people that are ready for whatever the world brings. And so to that end, what do you think? Here's the next question. If you know who these people are, you know what they look like, what are the practices, you guys? What do you need to do? What have you seen in your life that are like good calorie intakes for you? What, what, what are the practices, the habits that you think will lead to successfully building a foundation? What are they? Hide God's word in your heart. Hide God's word in your heart. Now, by that, do you mean specifically memorize scripture or read it? No, what, what in particular? Both, both of those things. So when adversity comes, God brings his word to mind. Yeah, hide his word in your heart. So when adversity comes, his word, it's like it's there. It's available for the Holy Spirit to use. Get this well that you've, that you've dug. That's great. What else? Stay connected to your church. Stay connected to your church, right? This is like, so have you ever seen the illustration, John, where like, you got all these ash, all these um, logs in the fire, all burning red coals, and you take one out, right, and you put it on the hearth, away from the others, and you come back in 20 minutes, the ones in the fireplace, they're still glowing red, they're drawing heat from each other and sustaining each other, but the one on the hearth is gray, and it's, it has lost its heat, right? Lots of people will think that you can, I think I can do this on my own. I think that if I just download, you know, I don't know, a Tim Keller sermon every week, that can be my church, False. Okay, the dude can teach. Download his sermons. The dude's amazing. But 
that's not church, right? That's not community. That's not living in the, in the vital connection with other human beings. So vital church involvement, great. And by the way, that doesn't just mean show up in here, right? That means show up. What, what does it mean? If we say church, let's get, let's get a handful of things. What are we talking about? What's going to make your church involvement actually sustain, you know, sustaining for you? What are the factors? Yeah, Catherine? Right. So if you're using your gifts, if you're walking in your gifts, you're not just showing up as an audience member, but you're actually involved, you're actually giving, you're doing stuff, you're participating. Maybe if you get asked to be on the vestry, you agree and you serve, right? Maybe you're leading a life group. Maybe you're volunteering with the kids downstairs. Maybe you are uh, providing transportation for kids going to camp. Maybe you're doing any number, I mean, there's a million different things you could do, but you're, you're, you're actually participating. That's great. What else? All under the heading of your church involvement. What else? Yeah, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so take the initiative. Don't, don't just wait for somebody to come to you, but like jump forward and say, hey, I'd love to do this. Could I do this? Or is there a need that I can meet? Right? Very good. Yeah. Dan? Uh, be connected to a smaller group of people where you can really do life together. So huge. So gigantically huge. Like we would say maybe that's like maybe the number one thing is to be involved in a life group, right? Is it number one? It's in the top three. I mean, it's, it's up there. We don't need to rank them all, right? But to be in a, in a, and what's a life group? Like 10 people, six to 12 people that you're getting together once a week. Um, maybe it's all the people in, in your same life stage, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's, you know, a diverse, more diverse group. I lead a life group Tuesday mornings at like the crack of dawn, like early, 6.30. It's dark when we get up, right? But we have a great time, and we're studying the scriptures, and we, there's a community and a fellowship as we gather around that, right? We strongly encourage you to be in a life group. We'll, we'll come back to that one more later on. Mac, did you want to speak to that or just a different thing? Yeah, absolutely. And so we're actually, it's a great kind of promo. So in the sanctuary, we're doing a series on suffering throughout the month of January, and we're going to be exploring some of those things. So if you miss the first service, you come into the second, you'll hear that we're going to, we'll kick that off. You'll hear that kicked off just in like a half hour or so. So yeah. Helen? Um, for me, I need to be, have safe people in my life that I can personally be transparent to. Yeah. Okay. So people in your life that you're safe, that you can be transparent. And that, that might overlap with your life group. We'd like your life group to be that, but it, it may be, you may be in a co-ed life group and you'd rather have single sex, or it may just be some people that you really need an extraordinary level of safety. And to cultivate and that's, that's huge. About. Yeah. And it has to be of my gender. Yeah. You know, my... Co-ed life group is fine. I'm saying I need that and I also need yep. uh, a female in my life that I can be transparent with in order to care. Yeah. You know, I, 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 well, I totally agree. Some of you, I've, I've told you this before, but I went to James Madison University. Todd Meyer and I were in school together. And when we graduated, there were seven of us, a couple of, a couple of us invited the rest to go on a camping trip um, after we got out of school. And we basically, it's, it sounds a little goofy, but, but not really. Like we, we challenged the rest of these guys to form a, a lifelong covenant. So there's seven of us. And I, I use the language covenant on purpose. It's meant to be a, a, a strong thing. And so for the last I don't know, 92, when was that? 25 years ago. For the last 25 years, we each write a letter to the others every two months, and we get together once a year. All seven of us get together. We, we've been doing it for 20, we've never missed a year, 25 years. And these, Todd's one of them, and uh, these are the closest friends in my life. And they, there's, they know everything. We know each other, you know, inside and out. And, um, and the richness to, the, the, the goodness to have made that decision 25 years ago when we were reasonably stupid has borne fruit, uh, you know, this many years later. We're so rich to have, to have done that. And I hope that you guys have or will develop these super close friendships where you've got that transparency. So good. Okay, one more thing. Church involvement is going to make a difference for you. Dan? I want to bogart this discussion, but uh, to be engaged corporately in worshiping our God. Absolutely. Yeah, right. We were just showing up, right? We're going to be here. We're going to be in this room. We're going to be singing praises to him. There's, he's invited us to praise him, not because he's 
insecure and needs to know how great he is, right? But because we need to praise. Do you know, I often will find that in that service, when I, when I come in here and it's, the week is just done, it's damage, it's very often for me that the healing takes place in the song, right? Where there's some song, music's magic, turns a key. And I say that, I'm a teacher. I wish, I wish it was the sermon. Woo! Because the teaching is what God really values most of all, right? But it's not, it's so often it's the music that I finally repent, right? It, it breaks my heart again, or I'm comforted and reassured, reassured, right? So we need that. We need to show up and to join in, the, join in the worship of God together, okay? All these sorts of things. Excellent work, you guys. It's a good list. You need all of these ingredients if you're going to build a strong foundation. But I'm curious, do you know, uh, you guys know Willow Creek, it's a huge church in Chicago. Bill Hybels, the pastor there, or I think he just retired, actually. But they've had a massive influence for good um, over the last, I don't even know, 30 years or something. And, but they did a big research project. It's probably been maybe a decade since they did it, where they were shocked and dismayed to find that some of their fundamental assumptions about ministry were flawed. They believed that participation was going to be the, the, the single biggest predictor that people are going to be mature and grow in faith is that they're showing up to stuff, right? If you come to the meeting, if you sit right there and listen, sing, be here, then that's going to predict maturity and growth. And they found out that it did not. That wasn't it. Do you remember what, did anybody see this report and what the actual answer was? The single biggest predictor of growth in Christ? You want to guess? Music? Is that what you say? No, it wasn't music. Trial. Trial. What, these are good. No? What did you say, Kelly? It is self-feeding. Self yes, very good. The single biggest, single biggest predictor is self-feeding. If I am taking personal responsibility for my spiritual growth, that's the thing. And I, this, is, this is true in my life. I, when I got to college, I got involved with crew, and whatever. And I was just showing up for stuff. I didn't really, whatever. But I would hear people having a quiet time, which is a silly thing to call it. But people have a quiet time. And I didn't, and I didn't, and I didn't. And then my junior year, I just noticed, okay, like everybody I know who is actually like mature, and the people that I admire most have all at one point or another expressed that they have this, they set aside a half hour a day or 20 minutes a day or an hour a day or whatever it is a day, and they're reading their Bibles. And so I finally like, all right, fine, I will do this. And guess what? It changed my life. Like it really did. When I decided that I will be the responsible agent, then it changed my life. And at that point, you guys... It's not, by the way, it's not just setting aside a, a chunk of time a day, although I strongly encourage that, but it's the attitude behind it that says, therefore, I'm going to go to church and lean in. I might take notes, right? I'm going to be paying attention. I'm going to reflect on this. It means that when I'm in my Bible study with my other friends, I'm going to actually do the homework, right? Imagine that. I'm going to do the prep to show up so that I'm ready for the conversation, or I'm going to be intentionally seeking out other people so that I, I know that if I'm teaching something, the best way to learn something is to teach it, right? And if I'm really going to flourish and grow, it's like, have you ever seen this illustration where you've got, um, you know, the, the three bodies of water to the, what is that, to the east of Israel is the, up the top is the um, Sea of Galilee, flowing out of it is the Jordan, and then it dumps into the Dead Sea. Well, the Sea of Galilee is full of life and richness and good things, and the Dead Sea is dead, right? Okay. Why is it, the reason the Dead Sea, do you know why the Dead Sea is dead? There's no outflow. It's the lowest place. There's no gravity that's going to pull anything out of that, so it's dead. So the it, Sea of Galilee's got in and out, and therefore there's flow and there's dynamism and there's life. The Dead Sea, there's input, but it never gives out. And so the thing, the only way water's going to get out of there is going to evaporate, and all just the crud just kind of accumulates, and it's super salty, and you can float in it, you know? And it's dead. You want to be the Sea of Galilee, you guys. You want there to be inflow and outflow, that you are discipling somebody. Is there a younger believer that you're mentoring, that you're, get, you're getting up early with them to impart things into their life? Are you teaching to others? Are you giving out? These are the things, right? If you're a self-feeder, then you're going to, interestingly, you're going to not just be a self-feeder, but you're going to be an others feeder because you know that that action is actually going to circle back for your good. If you're going to go spend time in prisons, right, working with other people, it's going to benefit you, not just the people in the prison. So being a self-feeder, this is going to be, this is the thing. And so if you are, then awesome, that's great. But if you're not, go ahead and just do that, right? Today, decide, you know what, Lord, I'm going to make a commitment to you. Not, this is not an external thing. I'm not going to, like, collect, you know, like, sign-up sheets. But make the decision. I'm going to say, I'm going to set aside the, is it the first half hour of the day? Is it the last hour of the day? Is it, 
You're going to get that get a Bible app so you can listen to your Bible in the car so you can redeem time when you're raking leaves and doing nothing. Whatever it is, being that self-feeder is going to, that reality is going to make you make decisions. That will, dis- that will compel you to be in a life group. If you're not in a life group, you're going to say, okay, I, got, I need this. I need a community of people where there's relationships and life, where your word is taught, where I can grow. And that's going to be transformative in your life. It is in the life of everybody who does it. Okay? So I want to I think about this. Take all this life self-feeding, and let's drive it into a life group thing. And tell me about the best things in your life group. And if it's not been at Church of the Holy Spirit, that's fine. What about when you were a student? What about, you know, the church you used to attend? What about some friends of yours? It's like this unofficial rogue Bible study that you've been part of. That's great, too. Like, what has made being in a small group of believers vibrant and dynamic and life-changing for you? What are, what are the factors? I'm sorry, what is it? Sean, okay, what do you mean by accountability, Sean? Okay, so for, by accountability, what Sean means is that you have a group of people that when you blow it, and P.S., you will, right? It's okay, right? We all, we're broken, and we just make, we blow things all the time. When you do, there's a transparency, right? We're, we're not just hiding, but we, we say, man, I did that thing again that I asked you to help me not to do. And there's just some external kind of function that actually helps you, helps this work, right? I think, uh, forgive me if I get these details wrong, but isn't that like the essence of Weight Watchers, that their whole, their whole kind of philosophy is like, there's accountability. Am I wrong about that? Like you show up and you have other people that are walking through the same thing you're walking with you and they help you meet whatever your goals are, your behaviors, and if you kind of don't do well, then they're there to kind of get you back on track before it gets too late, right? That just works. Like humankind, we just do better when there's somebody else that we trust, that loves us, that is willing to kind of speak into our lives. So accountability. What else has made a small group be a positive thing for you? Yeah, Teresa? Yeah. 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 So what, in case you couldn't hear Teresa, what she's saying is that you got a whole bunch of different people and everybody's contributing to the stew, right? Everybody's going to add their things and they're going to see things that you didn't see. There are things that you will learn in a group that you simply can't learn on your own. And I hope that what Teresa just said describes this room right here, right? This is not just me speaking as if I've got all the answers, but my job is to facilitate and to draw out of you the answers, the wisdom and the knowledge that's in this group. In a healthy life group, you're going to have that same thing where you've got just a bunch of different perspectives that add value to the thing. You can just sit at home alone and read a Bible, and I hope that you will, but you need to augment that. You need to add to that with the input of other people. So, for sure. Okay, what else has made a life group? Why do you love the life group you're in? Sam? Um, having people to experience the joys with and not the sorrow. Yeah. Like yeah, absolutely. Just, you just walking through life, there's ups and downs, there's happiness, sadness. It's more, it's more fun to share your happiness if you express it, and it's easier to bear your griefs if you're sharing this, right? And we want these groups to not just be a data dump, but there's this community in life, for sure. Yeah, jump in. Lisa? Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got, so what she's saying is that you've got a co-ed side and the same sex side. We can kind of split up the group and do different things, hold each other accountable, know the whole family. There's just all kinds of value. That's why God, by the way, puts us in a church, right? So we're multi-generational. Uh, the, ideally, we're supposed to be multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi Pick a group. What is it? Socioeconomic status, right? Um, because we learn from each other and our differences as much as our samenesses. Okay, good. How about one, one more factor here? Yeah, Jeff? Unconditional love. Unconditional love, right? So, and do you mean from vertical or, vertical or horizontal? Both. Both, right? So unconditional love. So this, your group should be a place where the love of God is made clear, where you're learning in the scriptures uh, to delight more in him, and you're seeing it lived out, right? You need some love with skin on it sometimes, right? So other people that are manifesting that to you. Here are what I think 
of the five elements of any kind of key, five key ingredients in a healthy small group. This is what I want to be true. I hope it's true of our life groups here at Holy Spirit. There's this. Number one, quality biblical content. Our life groups must be centered on the Word. Now, sometimes, maybe you're studying a book or something, but that, that itself is drawing on the Scriptures, but it's quality biblical content. This is the nutrition source that's going to change your life, okay? Number one, quality biblical content. Number two, community. And many of your remarks are expressed under that heading, right? This is where the accountability happens, the sharing of joys, the express, experience of love. It should be a place of community that you're no, you know each other. Third thing, self-discovered learning. I'm a huge, huge fan. I don't, we don't want to just dump the truck. We want there to be this breadcrumb trail where you're learning this, and you're learning this, and you're learning this, and then like the lights go on. Like, oh, I get it, right? In a healthy life group, the leader is able to produce that effect, that there's self-discovered learning. Third thing, progressive life change. It's not just data, right? We don't just want to like accumulate Bible trivia so we can win at the game, right? We want to be transformed, changed, that parts of my life are being surrendered to him, that I didn't even realize I was holding back. And as that is happening, that's what has made those, the reason these people are spiritually vital and vibrant is because their life has been changed bit by bit over decades probably that's going to produce it. And then the fifth one, and we haven't really said this, this is sometimes not as well known, I think the fifth ingredient in a really healthy life group is going to be an outward focus. Sometimes in my Bible studies, and we would used to like leave, physically have an empty chair so as to say there's always room for one more, right? There's, we always want new people to come into these groups. That can be hard, and we can tend, our nature can be to like, hey, I'm just going to like circle up, right? This is just me and my friends, and all you stay away, right? Don't, don't screw up. We have a good thing going on here. Leave us alone. Those are unha- those, that's a Dead Sea kind of life group, okay? You want this thing to be, you want there to be a dynamism and a flow. So there's an, there's an outward focus. There, new people are welcome. And there's, there'll be occasions, just like Helen is saying, you might have other places that need to be more safe, Right? But if, we, if you have those things, then it creates an opportunity to be open and gracious and welcoming to invite others in so they can experience it. And then, ready for this? As that life group grows and flourishes, what it ought to do is it ought to birth more life groups. Okay? And I know everybody hates that. Like, no, 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 you're, these are my friends. I know they're your friends, but there's 168 hours in a week. All right? You got like one hour in life group. Hang out with your friends some other time. Okay? But like grow, allow this thing. If you've got a great group, the nature of, I mean, this is, God has built this into the very nature of biology in the world. Love produces new people. Have you noticed how that works? It's just what happens, okay? We're supposed to do this. When you, when two people fall in love, they just have babies, okay? That's what works, okay? There's a little bit, there's a connection in there, but we'll leave that unremarked on for the moment, okay? I'm not asking your life groups to be places where that exact thing is happening, okay? But, but, uh, but they should be, you should be birthing new groups. We should just do it. We grow, more people get involved, and you're like, man, this, this is awesome. It's 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. I think it's time for us to start a new group, right? And so four or six, go and invite some new people, and we just grow. That's what we're looking for. And that's what's just healthy and dynamic and good. And many of you have been part of that, of starting new groups, because your old group was just too dang successful. And so we make new ones, right? You guys lived through that. Yeah. Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I haven't said that under the heading of life group, but certainly over, um, overarchingly, yes. And I think uh, that for that to be a, a normal, healthy thing that we are, I would, I would probably loop that under community, right? Is that we are together, we're praying for each other, we care for each other. I would, I would loop it under outward focus that we're praying for lost people, all of those things. But, but I think it's, you do well to make it explicit. So absolutely. Okay, so a healthy life group. You guys, how many of you right now are in a life group? Lots, okay? And I won't ask you to raise your hand if you're not, but maybe, look, look like maybe three-fourths of you are. If you're not, let me just tell you, there's room for you. We'd love you to get involved in one. The easiest way to do it is to go to the church's website. It's chsroanoke.com. And you find, just navigate through the links, right? And if you go there, you can send an email to Brian Morgan. He oversees that whole process, and he can help you get plugged in. And we'd love to help you find one that's, whether it's near you or a night that's, night that's uh, you know, works best for you with people maybe that you already know. Um, we would love you to be involved. We want, we would ideally say that literally every person at Holy Spirit is involved in a life group. You're experiencing the Word, experiencing community, meeting with others in prayer, all those things, okay? Um, but behind it all, hear this, the, the secret, the goal is not being in a life group. The secret to your growth is self-feeding. Life group is merely a strategy 
to meet that need. If you've decided, I, am going, I want to be a man or a woman who is spiritually powerful, that has the roots to withstand the difficulties of life, that is just a blessing to others, then there's some things that you can do. Chief among them is you can really determine you're going to be a self-feeder, you're going to lock it in, and to that end, I, I think not only have an individual time in the Word, but jumping into a life group is, is going to be a crucial step. Okay? Um, I think that's all I have to say. So anybody sitting on attack? Some final thing? Yeah. What you got, Dan? Uh, one of the things at the last point that you had about um, the outwardness. Yeah. And not only just an outward, like, do your take care of people, but there's something to say about when you go in mission to bring people together. Yeah. Like yeah. So Dan is saying there's, there's multiple aspects to the outward focus, right? So there's the, our group is welcoming the new people, but it's also that our group functions. We see ourselves as a group of people that are on mission. We're out just passively waiting for somebody to happen by, but we're recognizing, man, my life is about mission, right? We have been blessed to be a blessing, right? We have been called in to be sent out, and that should just be part of our mindset in a healthy group as well.